Okay then. Well, we are live with the 47th, nearly 50th episode of Space Rocks Uplink. And a warm welcome to everyone joining. Mark, how are you doing? Are you receiving? I am, yes. Finally, yes. Just running around. But uh, the thing is, being, as people will know, I... Uh, follow me on social media. I've moved back out to my shed in the in the garden, so it just takes that bit longer to go and get a cup of tea and run around the house. And uh, it, at least it's not raining at the moment, which is good. Oh, I've got to correct you there, Mark. No, you're you're uh, you don't you're not in a shed. You're in a psychedelic <laughs> dream um, of space. It seems. No, uh, uh, so I, I guess it's apparent to me with um, increasing frequency um, that we have people joining us for the very first time. You know, despite forty seven episodes. Um, you know, uh, frequently we'll have people that have only just discovered us, usually on account of the guests that we have aboard. So, so before we kind of get going with tonight's episode, why don't you give a bit of an introduction to Space Rocks and uh, and what it is you do over at Visa? Yeah, indeed. Well, just as the background here, um, this is a picture from uh, 1972 from uh, Soviet Union space art of which was quite remarkable i mean i've got this whole big book here next to me with, with some fantastic space art about how space is seen sort of conceptually not just as a bunch of hardware although there is a there's a rocket behind me here um <clears throat> but how it's seen philosophically and how it's seen culturally and the important role that space played in soviet union sense of identity and Soviet Union propaganda, you might say, uh, in, in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, but, you know, in a sense, that's what Space Rocks is about as well. It's about taking space, what we do in space. And at the European Space Agency, I'm the senior advisor for science and exploration. So my job is to do what I was doing all day today, look through recent scientific papers coming from our missions, using data from our missions, and then trying to translate that for different audiences, for um, scientific community who are not maybe in that particular field, for our committees and delegates, uh, so that they can go away knowing what it is that we're doing with our program, but also for the general public. Um, and so while we could spend the whole evening talking about the Yarkovsky effect uh, tonight, I suspect I might spare you all that. Um, and, and what we do in Space Rocks is take those space themes, whether that's to do with exploration, inspiration, technology, application, looking at the earth as well as looking to space and, and and talk to people like our guests this evening about what where that touches them and then what where what they do whether they're artists musicians uh filmmakers writers uh anything else where maybe they touch us and cause inspiration for us so that's space rocks in a nutshell indeed indeed and of course tonight i guess we have two artists joining you know who you know in their own ways have connected these worlds, you know, that that do always seem to enjoy these deep interconnections. You know, the space and the arts, space and music specifically, um, has always had a resonance, you know, for me. And it's always been obvious, probably because I'm someone who grew up in the era of 2001 and, you know, all of his successive films, a film that comes up with surprising frequency on this. No <laughs> surprise, given that we're both fans. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it is just that fusion of sound and vision and concepts related with science um, that just is is so very alluring and it's really like nothing else. So so what can you tell us about our guests this evening? Right, so we have two guests this evening who are musicians. Um, the first of those is Laura Kidd. Um, she's a Bristol-based musician um, who has gone by various nom de plume in the past. So uh, she makes war. And most recently, she's known as Penfriend um, and has recorded a whole series of albums um, independently, released them very successfully. And she has another album coming out very soon called Exotic Monsters. Uh, and she's very interested in that um, sort of technology, music, science interface. Um, and just one example, which we'll talk about more this evening, one example of that is using samples recorded at Eztec, um, our center here in the Netherlands where I work, um, and, and incorporating sound samples into her latest album uh, in some of the tracks. So Laura will talk about that. And the other guest is um, inspired by space in perhaps a slightly different way and has used found sounds, recordings, in some of his band's works. So this is Jay Wilgoose Esquire, uh, who's one of the three people in public service broadcasting. Um, in, in the space sense, well known for their album uh, Race for Space, uh, which is all about this this period, if you like, uh, the, the space race between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, in the 50s and 60s, and then the 70s as well. Um, but, but is also very interested in technology and 
how that's played a role throughout history. So well before the space race as well, and some of the other realms that they played. Indeed. Well, it's 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 a great uh, starting block to uh, to launch into this discussion. Of course, you know, fascinating backgrounds, and um, as ever, I'm excited to see where we might go. Jay and Laura, how are you doing? Are you receiving? I am. Hello. Yes. Hello. Likewise. Good evening. Good evening to you both. All right. Well, well, welcome aboard, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And um, you know, as ever, um, we we don't really constrain um, episodes of Uplink by too much, but we always start out with a big question. And so, Laura, I just wanted to direct the first one at you, and um, uh, you know, uh, to kind of frame what we're talking about. Why do you think space and music make such comfortable bedfellows? What's the connection? Why do you think it works? Because they really are very different things, aren't they? They are. I definitely come to space from an artistic angle, not a scientific one. So even though I've been very fortunate to play, uh, to perform songs at like, Space Shambles events, Robin Ince and Brian Cox, and, and be around people who know a lot about the science of space, people who've actually been to space and all of that, um, I know absolutely nothing about that side of it. But for me, it's very much about um, kind of looking inwards, but also zooming out. I remember a few years ago, I read that an astronaut had talked about how from space you could see the earth and you could see war and you could see obviously weather and things like that you could just see stuff from such a distance that it put everything into perspective and so for me that's where I come from when I think about space it's a lot to do with you know feelings of isolation I might have or feeling like I don't fit in or yeah feeling like I'm like an alien basically surrounded by people I don't understand and who don't understand me so I'm definitely coming to add it from that perspective not from any knowledge of science yeah. And so just bef <laughs> before we yeah, before we move on, I mean, what's interesting, a lot of people will often say when you're in space, you can't see the things you mentioned, you know, right. we're, okay. we're all unified, we're all together. And that's literally, you know, really not true. I mean, you can, the, 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 one of the classic examples of that is the India Pakistan border, for example, which is incredibly uh, well illuminated in order that people don't cross over it. Mm. Um, so this idea, and, and you can see the deforestation of the rainforest. You can see the draining of the the lakes, which are you know getting less and less. The Aral Sea, for example. Yeah. Uh, maybe you don't see that during a six month journey, but by comparing photographs, you can see how the world is changing. So I, I, I think that's an important point you make about, mm. in in a way, being external to humanity but attached to it, still being able to appreciate you know the, 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 that that isolation, but also that connection simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So, so, Jay, let me jump over to you then. Um, of course, your work with uh, public service broadcasting has been, in a sense, um, recasting some of the things which happened in the space race and throughout history and uh, the history of technology. And, and uh, if you weren't able to hear it earlier on, this is from 1972 Soviet piece of graphics. There's a, there's a rocket in the background, of course, but I'm covering that lovely. up. But, uh, lovely. Um, so obviously the race for space is the album which p many people in the space domain know you for but but psb have not only been there you're very engaged in this issue about the interface between humanity and technology so w what was your entry point to that well uh well, that's yeah that's that's a very big question i don't know i think um but in terms of the you know the interface between humanity and technology you know that's that's that is what one of our live shows is i think that's kind of um you know on a fundamental level it's it's trying to bring together the electronic and the technological aspects and marry it with the human side of what we do to present a kind of fundamentally electronic music live show, but do it in a way that has, you know, hopefully great humanity to it. Um, I've talked before about the kind of needing to reserve the right and the ability to make individual errors in that, which is a big part of the human factor. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it, it cascades through everything we do, but I think it probably starts, you know, looking at, through it from our kind of frame, it probably starts from that idea of, um, you know, the live show is is that kind of melding of, of sound and vision and technology and humanity all at once, um, with sometimes regrettable, uh, <laughs> regrettably unreliable results. But you know, that's part of the uh, that's part of the deal, isn't it? Yeah, indeed it is. I mean, I, I suppose um, you know, uh, reflecting on something that Laura said, you know, connected with that, um, you know, uh, space can mean very different things to different people, right? You know, um, when, when you use the word, you were talking about, uh, you know, a conceptual framework, something that has philosophical implications, um, something that is obviously an area of exploration, um, but you're also talking about the history as well, you know, and just like what, what that has meant for people, you know, just in the last 60 years, but also, you know, for the Soviet Union, you know, far beyond that, you know, I'm familiar with like the sort of like the 
literature and the philosophical underpinnings of why they wanted to go there, you know, very different from, you know, perhaps, you know, America, depending on how you look at it, which is so interesting. And yet, um, the first thing that Laura said was, I'm not coming at it from a scientific perspective. So, so how did you stumble upon it then? So what was your first exposure? Well, one of the first books I saw in my parents' house, which I don't know why I'm saying it's my parents' house, it's also obviously my house, <laughs> um, was, that, that just shows how isolated I've, I've always felt, um, was an Isaac Asimov book. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And I was way too young and didn't read it. But then when I was um, a bookworm at school, when I was a young teenager, I went and started reading through every John Wyndham book there was. And so it's Dave the Triffids. So there was stuff about, I can't remember all the names of them now, but there was stuff about, um, I suppose stuff about inner space and outer space. And so there's all of this idea that, um, I suppose it's about reimagining the world. And that's what science fiction has always done is reimagined the world in all these different ways, sometimes in ways that then end up becoming true or be becoming something that we then want to do. So it's all sort of combined. But just the, the idea that our imaginations as humans um, is, is not always that far away from what reality ends up being. I find that really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think as songwriters, we are one of the things that we can do is try to imagine an alternative to what is happening right now, whether that's a utopian one or a dystopian one, or, or whether it's to do with, like we were talking about inner space, like going really deep inside yourself, or then thinking about the fact that we are all made from stars, you know, that lovely idea. And, um, and that we have so much in common that we're all, you know, we, we breathe the same air, we're all in the same air. And obviously with the last, you know, 12, 14 months of a of global pandemic, that's become even more obvious because we're obviously able to pass things to each other in this, in this way, which is terrible. But, but in the best days, that is a wonderful thing to be able to say, well, I breathe the same air as everybody else, therefore I'm not that different. And so that's the, the kinds of things I think about a lot. But yeah, I came to it from science fiction, for sure. I'm intrigued that you you said you didn't read the Asimov, but went to Wyndham instead. I think you probably made yeah. the right choice, actually, in retrospect. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it, it's one of the... Uh, Alex and I have talked about this many times, you know, Asimov's science fiction for me has paled. I mean, it, it was right. something I read as a kid, but it was very much that sort of, you know, externality. It was about humans and how humans might change. But if I think mm -hmm. about Wyndham's novels, they're... They're not even almost science fiction, are they? Really? I mean, they use no. a science fiction setting to tell stories about uh, about ourselves. Yeah. So, so Jay, in that sense, you know, without being specific, you know, what are your favourite colours? Kind of questions. <laughs> but it was, was there a science fiction thing earlier in life, or did it come from the history side? Because again, I'm going back to that point that you know, you're not you're not confined at all in your work to the space domain at all. It's, it's the broad, much broader history. Um, of, of science and technology uh, as expressed through music. So was it science fiction or was it reading the history books about the Industrial Revolution, which is something I had to do when I was a kid? I, did, I didn't do history at school. I kind of dropped it as soon as I could. So it, was, it wasn't reading books about the Industrial Revolution, sadly. Um, I'd probably be far more intelligent if it was. But uh, no, it, I think it was from being, you know, slightly in, in introverted and um, occasionally lonely teenager, probably watching far too many science fiction films. And I heard you in the intro mentioned 2001 and how often that you both speak about that film and that film for so many reasons has been such an inspiration to me um not just in terms of the subject matter but just in terms of the the boldness of the narrative or the lack of narrative and mm -hmm. you know that kind of the the ending that just comes from nowhere in terms of you know a, a conventional massive hollywood release um it's such a bold and brave and sort of brilliant film um that is kind of i'm i'm constantly aiming to get anywhere near that level of artistic uh, <laughs> per perfection basically and failing you know as most people do sadly um but yeah th that that kind of area area and um, you know that feeds into Blade Runner I think is possibly my my favorite film of all time um you know I, I know I was geeky enough to write a, an A-level dissertation of sorts on you know Blade Runner versus Frankenstein and how they're both kind of telling the same story all that kind of stuff um yeah, I was an interesting seventeen-year-old, obviously. Yeah, your timing is good as well because you've just come on after we actually had Vangelis on a couple of weeks ago to talk about his music. Right. So uh, yeah, there you go. Right. You, you, yeah. There's, well, a, there's a hard act to follow musically, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think you wouldn't even try to follow, would you? Yeah, <laughs> You'd just yeah, be like, yeah. "That's that's been done. Let's yeah. try and do something else entirely." No. Um, yeah, that that you know, but also part of the whole science fiction appeal, I think, is the idea of being able to conjure and create your own worlds and your own universes, and you know, 
tying that very uh, kind of um, unsubtly back to us, but that, that idea of, of having our own little kind of world where everything makes sense in terms of us and how there are these threads that we weave through the stuff that we do, um, that idea of kind of giving your own universe a sort of a thread, I suppose, that you that people can hook onto and that, that gives that sense of continuity, um, that's kind of underpinning all of it as well. But science fiction is certainly, I think, my way into the whole area of, of space and technology. Yeah. Mm. And yet, you know, before Alex jumps back in, you haven't written albums about science fiction per se. I mean, you haven't kind of gone all prog and, and you know, some Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy novels. With, you know, Well, you haven't heard the fourth one yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's nothing wrong with Dungeons and Dragons. I'm just well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, we, but but, it, but it's, very, it's very much about the reality of the things that were done, but expressing them, right? I mean, is that is that because you think science fiction as a as a trope for music is is uh, not overexposed maybe I mean, there's been plenty of it but but actually going to the heart of real things in a sense i don't know i think i mean it's definitely helped her music to connect with people i think when you can latch on to an event as as mesmeric as apollo 8 and passing around the uh, you know the far side of the moon for the first time then, then regardless of how good or bad your music is you've already got a certain kind of human interest just from the fact that you're telling that story which is yeah you know, extraordinary and mind boggling. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it wasn't a conscious decision. I don't think it's everything with us is really done on the basis of pragmatism and recognizing the lack of resources slash talent and tailoring everything to serve that. So, you know, you kind of, you're, you're taking some of your limitations and trying to make them into strengths. So uh, the fact that none of us is kind of, you know, blessed with the voice of an angel means that we ended up working with this archive material. And if you're working with archive material, then, you know, trying to use it to tell a narrative and trying to give it give your music that kind of human uh, interest then obviously if you're a science fiction and space interested person you're going to be drawn to this incredible era of history um especially given how open nasa are with their archives mm. um so i think i think it's more a kind of a, a pragmatic judgment rather than than me sitting down and going oh i'm not sure about writing a science fiction rock opera you know i'm not i don't rule it out i don't rule it out yeah. But why would it have to be proggy? This is my question. Oh, yeah. Because I, I didn't mention that word. Sorry. No, yeah, I know. Apologies. No, I know you didn't. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not pointing fingers. But I think it's um, there are a lot of cliches and a lot of things, and it doesn't have to be about that. So, like, my music's quite grungy. It's got some synths in it and stuff. It's not proggy, but it can still have kind of proggy themes. It can have the theme of me being on my own constellation, looking back at the loneliest generation, which is one of the songs on the new record. Yeah, I don't think we we need to fall into any of those things. And I think whatever people love, if it's Dungeons and Dragons, prog, whatever else, you love it. So it's great, you know. All right. Well, no, Nothing don't, don't with don't, anything that you love. Don't don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, I maybe not, not. I don't think I have ever played Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm a. You will. Yeah, well, I, we will. All right. It's inevitable. <laughs> um, it, he's been trying to convert me to metal for for years now, but um, no. <laughs> but but I but I well, I suppose what I'm saying is at least historically, it's that sort of classic trope of you know plugging in the Mellotron and playing a 30 minute rock ep, you know <laughs> epic, which would mostly be in prog. And, well, I don't know. Well, maybe I did. Did grunge ever do? I suppose Tommy did, right? I mean, that wasn't exactly prog, right? You could call that science fiction. The Who with Tommy. It was, um, yeah. Yeah, the rock opera the thing stuff. Is we can do whatever we like. That's the wonderful yeah, thing. So that's yeah. the thing. We're talking about creating worlds. You can put anything in your world. That's it doesn't so even have to make sense all the time. You know? <laughs> that can be part of the appeal. It can be like, yeah, yeah, true. What? yeah. just make people ask questions sometimes. Yeah. 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 The, you know, um, but I'm struck by a, a certain parallel. Um, you know, that, that wasn't engineered. Um, you know, um, immediately when we're talking about stories about um, how you came in to, you know, be interested in, you know, um, the great beyond, you know, just like whatever framework it might happen to be. Um, it immediately goes to what kind of student you were, you know, just like, did you get, you know, because it's just like for a lot of people, um, you know, just like uh, whether they are, you know, fans of this stuff in their adult life, you know, very much comes down to like their, their childhood exposure and all that. Do, do you think more that, you know, music has a role to play in bringing people into this world, you know, this, um, you know, this, this area of, space exploration because certainly by using you know sounds actually generated by that actual endeavor i mean in a sense your music is is automatically doing that yeah i suppose so but i don't know that anyone listening to the songs that i've used space sounds on would necessarily know they were unless we told them but i am telling them because i think it's interesting i actually came to that um the, the s tech sound bank 
from my husband just found it. He was looking for fun plugins and he was just like, he gets obsessed with things and he emails me all this stuff going, we have to get this drum set and we have to get, because he makes music too and we make music independently of each other, but you know, he's often telling me all, all these brilliant sounds he's found. And most of the time I'm just like, I'm, I'm busy. That's cool, <laughs> you get them. And I don't do anything about it, but because this was space, I was like, yes. So I, got, I immediately downloaded them. And for me, it was just about creating an atmosphere, no pun intended, an atmosphere where I could then write a song on top of it. So that's what I did with the three songs on my new record, which include the Aztec sounds. Um, I'm, I'm really keen to tell people about this because not only uh, do I think it's an interesting thing in my song, obviously, because otherwise I wouldn't have put it in there, but also people can download them themselves and make music out of it because it's Creative Commons licensed stuff, which is awesome. Um, but like I said, I don't think if I wasn't telling them that people would go, that sounds quite a lot like a uh, gravel from Mars, <laughs> you know, but it's, it, yeah, it, for me, it was about find, it's always just about finding interesting sounds that I can make into a collage that then lead to the next thing that I write as part of that song. So I don't know. I don't know that my album's going to bring a load of people into thinking about space from just the sounds, but the concepts on there, I think maybe, because mm -hmm. like I say, it's about you know, inner space, personal power, imagining a different world for yourself, you know, within your own life and, you know, for humanity. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm not an arrogant enough person to think that someone's going to find my music and then go, I'm now going to study space. <laughs> but that would be really cool. I'd mm -hmm. love that. So, Maybe so just, they do when they listen to public service broadcasting, because <clears throat> that's much more connected. Yeah. So just to be clear for the audience who maybe don't know, the, these sounds are recorded the physical sounds of machinery and of electronics and bits and bobs at Eztec, which some I think the sounds are available as full sounds, as in you know just hear hear some wheels turning, um, and then you took a drum kit version of that, if I'm right, yeah, which Peter did. Kern, the artist in Berlin, made. Now there is the other thing I don't know if you've ever thought about this or or Jay whether you've used any of it. Um, other artists certainly have used quite a lot of it is this sonification of space data so rather than real bits and pieces or recordings of people taking the sounds of plasma around jupiter um which can of course you can't hear um mm. but you can play with the frequencies i mean it's it's a signal versus time so you can you can sonify it um and and, and that can that be quite interesting cool. at times it's very it can be very abstract but but, but and you, but it, and if i think if you over manipulate it to make music you kind of lost the essence of it which is that it's almost you know space is free form jazz it's just doing what it's doing and and going off but jay have you come across those things as well sort of data sonification i've seen them come out yeah i've, I've seen them when they've been released um i think the bulk of the, the sort of the big one, the one that made the most waves came out after I'd either written or after we'd released the race of space. So I think probably missed the boat there, but I think because we were sort of telling us a, a specific story about a specific mm. period in history, you know, 57 to 72, um, you know, I, I suppose I get quite kind of tunnel vision about that and quite, you know, it has to be from that period or about that period. Um, and, you know, trying to avoid the temptation to kind of jump across the lines a bit and kind of mm. and blur the boundary a bit. So, um, it, yeah, there are all sorts of interesting things you can do with, you know, adapting environments and making sounds out of them. And, and without talking too much about the next record we've done, but, you know, one of the things we did for it was I uh, wandered down a street with an electromagnetic kind of reader, I suppose, took took a light reading from somewhere got that sound and then ended up manipulating a, a bass drum sound out of it and that's the bass mm. drum in in the song is from walking down this particular street and hearing this particular pulse of kind of electromagnetic energy i suppose um so that yeah i mean again nobody would know that's what you've done and they, they're still taking your word for it you know <laughs> so um how much it's actually adding to the song is is uh, debatable but i think it's really cool stuff to do yeah. we didn't really do any of it on the race of space though in fact most of that was about taking out some of the annoying stuff that was in the background of the kind of the you know the more narrative stuff like the music that they were originally put on there and all, all that kind of stuff trying to get clean excerpts of the sputnik pulse rather than ones with this kind of very um romanticized uh, soviet voiceover yeah <laughs> well i mean um just on on the subject of um the race for space you know um it, it's it's a subject that comes up frequently um between mark and i both on uplink and also when we're just we're just chatting about things you know because in terms of the history of space exploration you know yesterday um if you follow space twitter a lot of people obviously you know celebrating um the anniversary of alan shepherd being the first american in space for instance you know um uh, a couple of weeks ago very sadly michael collins 
you know, um, yeah. passed away. You know, um, you know, uh, there have been so many advances, you know, um, just, you know, startling achievements, um, you know, in recent years and so on. And yet the um, the um, the mythology, you know, the, the, the true life, you know, um, adventures, you know, the drama, you know, of what happened in the 60s um, still overshadows so much of the talk of what we're doing right now. And it's, it also invites the basis of comparison. I mean, Jake, why 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 do you think that is? You know, because, of course, I mean, you, you wrote a concept album so much about it but why do you think it still just captures the imagination in a way that you know for better or worse um not much else quite does i think it's the human element i think it's the fact that it was you know it was men um you know after the dogs and after the chimpanzees but it was men sitting on top of these intercontinental ballistic missiles and willingly blasting themselves off into space um humans not men humans blasting themselves off into space and and putting themselves at great risk uh, in the name in theory of, of advancing humanity, obviously of advancing certain geopolitical interests at the same time, but in essence to, to advance humanity as well. Um, and, and without that, you know, I mean, all this, you know, the New Horizons stuff that's happened, there's, there's been countless kind of, you know, the, the landings we've just had on Mars. Um, these things are amazing, but I think the fact that you don't have a human presence there to, to kind of put your, as a viewer, to put your kind of imprint on, to, to view it through those eyes, it's fascinating seeing all this through the you know, artificial eyes, but it's nowhere near the same as Neil Armstrong putting a foot on the moon and and trying to imagine how that must feel for him. Nobody's, I think, trying to imagine <laughs> how these pieces of equipment are feeling, unless they're really into Wally or something like that. You know, um, I think it's, it's a kind of it's a world apart. No pun intended. Sorry. Funnily um, enough, though, one of the early songs I wrote for my new record is called "My Battery Is Low and It's Getting Dark." And it's the the last words of one of the Mars rovers. So I was very much trying to imagine. Well, hey, what there you go. Like yeah, be that. <laughs> maybe I'm just lacking the imagination. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, love robots. I think. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you say that. I mean, um, given uh, what well, Mark is, you know, um, you know, so um, you know, central to the kind of the anthropomorphization of um, Rosetta, you know, the Rosetta mission, you know, just like a, an idea of, I guess, Mark, you you can tell us more about that. But 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 that was kind of in that vein, making people emotionally resonate you know not just be interested in the science but also feel something as well right yeah one of the things which was interesting about that was that unlike with the rovers on mars or most of these robotic missions the the, the main trope there wasn't being lonely because there were two of them and they could talk to each other there was rosetta the main spacecraft and philae the small probe and that immediately lent itself to having them talk to each other and be individual mm -hmm. characters and in a sense that immediately then you know, made for human subjects because most of human relationships, I mean, there is, of course, we, we can solipsistic, solipsistically look and say, you know, it's just me and the rest of it doesn't exist. But much of our lives is about relationships. And by having two robots in the same place, at least we could humanize the story one level up. Um, it, it wasn't without its, you know, issues, at which point people said, oh, you've made, you know, Philae is the boy, he's the one going exploring, and poor Rosetta's just staying in orbit, and that's the girl, and this is just, and yeah, well, this, oh, yeah. well, this, yeah, well, this was an interview on Newsnight, actually, that I did, and this is the story, the thing I got thrown at me, it was like, you've just done exactly that, it's like, no, we haven't, I'm sorry, but, um, yeah, but I, I, I wanted to come back a little bit to that question which Alex just raised, which you talked to about, Jay, which is, because I'm slightly more cynical, perhaps, I mean, I, you know, maybe I'm in the business and, and a bit more cynical, because, well, as, as, as a metaphor, what I, I read something somebody wrote today, uh, a friend, and I won't name names, who said um, the end of 1960s, we went to the moon and, and then they promised us that we'd get, stay at the moon and then we'd go to Mars. They failed us. Um, now the new space race with the, the, you know, the private companies, SpaceX, or, uh, Blue Origin and what's going on, you know, they're going to deliver where they failed us. And I, and I you know... For me, that speaks to the heart of the matter. Who was they? I mean, they is us, right? We chose to do this and we put an imperative political one through our governments to do uh, Apollo. But then the world changed. And so space and politics are in intimately entwined. Certainly human space flight is. And I think it's very naive to sort of say, somebody failed me. I want, you know, I want Mars. I was, I was promised Mars. You know, I deserve Mars. So, so when you wrote, race for space you know how much did that that background which you mentioned that it was a geopolitical thing as much as it was about humans i'm not saying it diminishes what the humans did but it it, it certainly is the reason for having done it largely mm. yeah um, i'm not sure that was a question mark but i agree 
<laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, the geopolitical element to it, it could only have happened in that particular era with those particular set of circumstances. Um, but I, going back to what you were just saying about they and us I, and talking about Mike Collins, who recently died, um, you know, when he was on the Apollo 11 publicity tour around the whole world, and even in some communist countries, I think they went to, or, or certainly left-leaning countries that weren't part of the US kind of global, um, you know, agenda, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, he said everywhere they went, people were saying to him, we did it, we did it. And it wasn't you did it, it wasn't the United States of America did it, it was we did it. And I think yeah. it's a very strange, you know, I don't want to pass judgment on your friend, it's very strange, quite entitled and quite antagonistic sort of view <laughs> of the world to have there that they let us down, they didn't do this, you know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah, I can't really um yeah. that, so I probably Well again, I mean, you know, the question as I say, it's it's entwined in as much as they are us. I mean, we as we as a culture decide to do this or not, and it costs lots of money. So we have to decide to prioritize that against doing other things. Um mm. and you know, as an imperative, well, I've said it many times before, you know, I suspect that humans will go to Mars or at least the big countries, uh, the United States will will decide to send humans to Mars when China does it. Um, because there will be again, right? It'll be the symbol. You don't, want a, you don't want a Mars gap, do you? You don't want the Mars gap. There you go. <laughs> I think though it speaks to the I think it speaks to the fact that we do individually feel very powerless sometimes. So if if you feel that some if you feel that something's not going well, it's easy to try and blame someone else. You know, it's just a human thing to do. If things are going well, then it's we did it. But if something's going badly, it's like you failed me. I do understand that. I think it's not a great perspective to have, but it's um it's quite a natural response. And I think there's, you know, obviously there's ethical discussions around the fact that a lot of money is put into space travel and, and exploration. And we have homeless people in, you know, supposedly first world countries. So I spent a lot of my earlier years really not very interested in space because of that, because I just thought it seemed so wrong to me. But I, I obviously I'm a, I'm a big girl. I do understand that there's like different <laughs> pots of money. It's not quite so simple. And for me, it's just become about the wonder of, you know, this wonderful thing that we could explore and, and see other places and, and that, that sort of dream. But yeah, I think there's a lot, there's a lot more to anything, isn't there? You know, mm. obviously. I think that's the thing. Yeah. You, 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 what you don't get with the machines, I think is, and, and you can kind of anthropomorphize them and you can, you can infer it from them, but you don't get, and this is from a very non-religious person, but you don't get that spiritual sense of mm. what does this mean for us as a species um which i think you fundamentally have when you're sending humanity away from earth for the first time to look back on it and you know having human humans in these incredibly isolated environments where they have a perspective on humanity and and you know the world that no one's ever had before mm. it's an incredibly kind of spiritually intense experience and one that prompts all kinds of questions for I think for everybody who engaged with it and much mm -hmm. as these missions have been incredible feats of science and engineering and technology I don't think they I don't you know I don't think they should try to compete on that level because I don't think they can I think I think that yeah. level is solely reserved for kind of <clears throat> bigger questions about humanity and our, our role and our achievements yeah. I, w I would I would agree generally but I would make there's one big exception to that is that astronomy as a subject has that power to inspire I mean, Laura mentioned it earlier on, the fact that we know that we're made of star stuff, as, as Carl Sagan you know, famously popularised. He didn't find it out, of course. Um, so I th in an astronomy, we don't go there. It's just we, we can observe from a distance and still derive that spiritual wonder about what, what we did. So, so maybe in a way, the robots in the solar system fall in that weird gap, which is that in principle, humans could go there, but because they're not, we, we focus on what the humans can do in the solar system. But once we go outside the solar system, it's just us and our telescopes right and, and, and we i think find that's, that's the thing that... though it's still a human pair of eyes looking through yeah, a telescope yeah. and, and you're you're in, engaging with that on a on a human level and if you have a kind of you know a separate level between that you can still you know i'm, yeah. I'm sure it can still be an incredibly moving and intense experience but i, I don't think it's really going to get to the heart of what does it mean to be human in the same way that you know looking through a telescope yourself can or or you know sending humans to to outer space to the moon mm -hmm. to mars uh, would have the same thing yeah, like any any time you can see yourself or you can see the possibility of yourself in someone else's position, it can be incredibly inspiring and moving. I mean, I didn't think I could be a musician till I saw the bangles playing on top of the pops. I saw a woman <laughs> playing a bass guitar and a guitar and singing. Didn't I didn't see myself anywhere before that. So I think similarly, if you're watching was it, you know, so in the 60s, when people are watching these characters that they got to know because they had far fewer TV channels then as well and no 
Twitter stealing their entire attention span. So yeah, everyone's very focused on these people that could be them kind of, you know, that that's, I think, so, so powerful. Mm. And I think that's one of the <coughs> philosophical things I think, uh, I think about a lot, about like representation. Like if I can see myself doing something, then if I can imagine that I could do something, then, I, then I'm much more likely to be able to do it. And that's what I try to remind people through my music as well as about their personal power. Like it's not just you like this song, so you're a, you're a like on a post. You're a person with your own hopes and dreams. Let's, let's try and make sure that you can achieve those as well. So I think that if people are watching, people doing the most extreme, amazing things like going to space, that's incredibly inspiring on a personal level. And I just don't think you can replicate that as much mm. as, as interesting as astronomy is i'm sure and, well yeah, like, speaking as an astronomer i'm bound to defend them, but, <laughs> but, but I, I want to jump back before it's gone because the moment I, they, they, they don't come up often in in um in uplink in, in space rocks the bangles so um <laughs> <laughs> well you know um so you, now you're you're in, you're in bristol laura how long have you been in yeah. bristol nine years ah uh, so not not quite long enough so uh, the only time i've ever seen the bangles was um it must have been 13 years ago. I took my eight-year-old daughter. It was her first gig ever. In, That's in, in, super in, cool for her. That's and she great. didn't. And she didn't know that we were going to. We drove up from Devon, from Exeter, all the way up to um, to Bristol. And I had not told her why we were getting in the car on an evening, on a week school day evening, until we got to the whatever it was, the the O2 or the the venue in Bristol. Yeah the bangles and yeah well the look on her face was was wonderful but she was by far the youngest person in the room and i was probably unfortunately not the oldest person in the room they had lots of old fans like me but so if you can if you have a contact with Susanna hoffs please uh, bring her on <laughs> i'd love to try and get her on my podcast and then i can pass her on to you all right. absolutely there all right well, <laughs> indeed well let's just make the dreams happen um you know um, moving on um just flipping back just beyond the bangles um really quickly um um something you said there laura um was um, very um, resonant because it, it's it's something that also you know comes up when we're talking about this is is that um, I mean the reason why space rocks exists is we're we're not trying to recruit engineers and you know it's like, it, it is very much about outreach and explaining it but you know but there's a broader thing than simply bringing people you know into science you know um, at some level I suppose what we're trying to do um, in a way is get people um, switched on you know to all this so it makes them just better informed citizens, you know, more responsible mm -hmm. inhabitants of Earth, you know, um, you know, because so much of space uh, is really about Earth, isn't it, Mark? I mean, it's we're talking about um, issues of the environment, you know, um, ESA's Earth observation mission, you know, things that actually have implications on the down here, not just what's what's out there as well. And, and I suppose that's a thing that's so important to remember is that, you know, representation, getting people talking about these things, it's about more than simply, you know, bringing people, you know, at a, the, the right age to, to study the right subject so they can go on and become space explorers, whatever that might be. Mm. It's, it's just so their everyday lives can be enhanced. I guess that's the purpose of art as well, you know, is to enrich the human experience. And that's the point. So again, uh, Mark, I guess it's contagious. This isn't a question either. It's just a comment on something that you said. So, uh, <laughs> so you, you, you um, will have to let me know if you agree. Well, it'll all come out in the edit, I'm sure. There isn't an edit, it's live. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, well, let me pick up on that subject as well, because, you know, I, you, you tripped over yourself there, Jay, when you said it was it was it was men on top of the rockets. And then you corrected yourself, to say humans. And, you know, of course, mm -hmm. you were right. At the time, it was only men. Um, Valentina Tereshkova had gone into space very early, um, long before any American women went into space or anybody from anywhere else. And um, but but that has changed dramatically. I think that that representation um we're recruiting astronauts right now. Um, the, the deadline is the end of this month. So if you want to put your application, in, you have to do it soon. Um, and what we've done for the first time at European Space Agency, the first of any agency in the world, is we will be um, taking candidates, so-called para-astronauts, uh, people with certain ranges of um, physical disabilities, which may or may not work, we don't know, but we're going to investigate and see if they, you know, those uh, people could ultimately fly in space as well. And I think there's an awful lot that we haven't done in the past. If I think back to when the last bunch of astronauts recruited in 2009 and to the way we're conducting the program now, um, the world has changed enormously in that regard and, and, and for all the good and right reasons. So let, let's just completely flip from the space thing, though, and talk about how that is in, in the artistic domain. I mean, you know, how do, have you seen things change uh, I, it's an open-ended question. I mean, it's nothing to do with space now, but I thought let, let's just go there. 
Are you asking me? Yeah, go on. Well, it's been a long time since someone asked me what it's like being a woman in music, but um, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> well, is that because I'm not allowed to or because it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's, it's a question that men don't get asked. So I'd love Jay to talk about this as well because he's yeah, yeah, sure. going to have an interesting perspective as well, I'm sure, because we've both been doing music for a long time. Um, I don't have a set answer to this because I genuine, genuinely don't get asked it. Um, I'm a human being making music and I always have been. This is the experience I have. I think the things that have prevented me from doing what I would like to more than anything is being completely independent. So not working in a label structure, not having a manager, not having an agent and all of those things. But it is also proof that you don't have to do those things. So talking about representation, I'd rather be someone who represents an independent spirit than anything else than, mm -hmm. you know, than a person with blonde hair or whatever you want to sort of um, describe me as. I, I want to be someone who, who can prove to others that if they have not a dream, because I think that's a bit too idealistic, but if you have something you want to say, say it, you know, if you have something you want to express, do that thing. If you have a dream that you'd like to write a novel one day, but you've never written anything, tr just write a sentence this week and then do another one next week. That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in encouraging. If it helps people to see a woman making music and being independent, that's cool and all. But I'd love us to look past that really at this point, because mm. it really should be, we should be post that question, I feel. Yeah. I mean, just at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to defend myself, I didn't mean oh, no, it that okay. way. I don't... didn't really mean it that way so much as, you know, right. the world has changed dramatically in the mm. last 10 years where, mm. I mean, I found maybe it's because I am an old white man that I ask, I find myself challenged by those questions more and more. And I've got young mm. kids who talk about it in very different ways to the way I talk. And I don't mean the gender thing, but every, the everything thing, right? The, the yeah. bigger questions of diversity, it wouldn't have been an issue. We never would have thought about it 13 years ago. I haven't. 12 That's years. That's a ago. shame. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And, because and when you're in a in in a, a group of people who are affected by those things, and even I'm, you know, I'm myself as a white woman. I'm a woman, you see, as you may have realised. Um, I have had to deal with certain things that I shouldn't have had to deal with just because I'm a woman. So if I was a woman of colour, then it's 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 really bad to say that 13 years ago it wasn't something people were thinking about because. I would have still been a woman of color then and would have been my entire life and that's just it mm. i just don't think that's cool you know it's it, it's it should have been being thought about then if it wasn't but it is now that's an improvement but i don't know it's, it's a very well, thorny again, topic again but... well again i'm defending myself i meant the para astronaut thing i mean that would right. that's that specifically has yes. been uh, something that's been brought in in the last few years. It's yeah, been talked about over time actually. before, you know, you don't need your legs in space, right? There might be an encumbrance to some extent. Yeah, exactly. That's been there. But now we're doing it and I think that that's a, a positive thing. But Definitely, yeah. So Jay, you pick, pick up the ball from me because I'm just digging myself a hole here. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, taking the, the, the question in, in terms of representation in music, um, you know, in all forms, whether it's, it's sort of, you know, gender-based representation or, or, or race-based representation or, or yeah, I mean, I think we are finally starting to see kind of more mainstream acceptance of some of the things that we, sh we should all have been thinking about and insisting upon for so long. And, and so many of us hadn't been probably because we're too busy wrapped up in our own privileges. And I think, I think the fact that that kind of is starting to, um, you know, seep into the mainstream consciousness in a, in a bigger way is to be applauded much as it is regrettable that it's taken this long in so many ways um but the fact you know that festival lineups are under increasing correct pressure to make themselves so you know so much less skewed towards male and male acts and male only acts um you know it's very easy to look at that being a, a male oriented act and start feeling threatened by that and thinking oh crikey you know we're not going to get on any festivals this year because but you have to really you know you just have to kind of put all that to one side and, and kind of engage with the bigger questions and the bigger kind of aspects of all of this, which is that, um, you know, these kind of aspects of representation should have been being considered for many years and they, they finally are now. I think one of the biggest things that concerns me in the UK at the moment, is obviously not all of your viewers will be in the UK, but is, is the kind of closing off of any kind of funding for children from less affluent backgrounds and for bands from less affluent backgrounds um, all the avenues that were previously there for, for people from those backgrounds to get into music um, 
and and they've made the UK's music scene such a rich and you know extraordinarily successful place. So many of those avenues are being closed down. Whether it's you know funding for higher education music, whether it's grassroots venues giving these people you know giving all musicians, but especially giving people who don't have the Brit school behind them or whatever, um, you know the, the place to kind of hone their craft and actually get in front of people and work out what they're doing. Uh, affording rehearsal rooms, affording equipment, all of these things are more affordable than ever before to make music on your own. But being in a band is still expensive. Playing with other musicians is expensive and trying to ensure that kind of access for more than just privileged um you know middle class and upper class kids i think is is uh is more important than ever and i think i think that kind of aspect um is something we would like to try and do more to help as a band um recognizing our own extraordinary privileges in that front um but yeah we 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 can all do a lot more can't we mm. um and acknowledge that we should have done a lot more in the past but you know yeah yeah that's my well, ramble on it no no it's it's not a ramble at all it's an incredibly important um conversation you know um because of course you know the devaluation of the arts is something that we're all worried about because it's not just art for its own sake at times it can be a conduit for other understandings as well and just look at what we're talking about today space sounds the connection between music and science we've covered everything from the apollo program to the rosetta mission um you know what the significance of astronomy is and, and all those things and so it is interconnected, but I think it can justify itself. It's not just because it relates. And I think that's what STEAM education rather than STEM education is all about, right? You know, it's just kind of putting the arts on that equal footing. And of course, when you see the defunding happening, um, when you see it becoming um, a privileged space, it is deeply worrying, you know, uh, because um, you have to get kids early um, with so many of these things, I think. And I think that um, it's an important conversation to have. And I suppose this is something that relates back with, you know, another thing that does come up from time to time, um, which is, you know, what space and its exploration signifies to me is not always just about technology, right? You know, um, if you look at ESA, for instance, is it 22 countries, Mark, um, cooperating? That to me is a real innovation, something that symbolizes something far more significant than just the technology that we require to get things to comets or whatever else. It's like, because that to me is extraordinary. You know, almost every evening we can, you know, watch the ISS perhaps doing, you know, a pass, um, you know, but we don't always realize it, but that's just a lot of different countries coming together to cooperate, you know, and to me that feels like a far more significant and valuable message than the technology alone, which is usually where our thoughts turn toward, you know, and, and that, you know, I, I don't want to reduce it all down to the gee whiz factor, you know, um, but what to me is really astonishing is what that power of cooperation means and what it means for, you know, scientists artists, musicians, to kind of connect under a common cause, um, you know, just to kind of to kind of share ideas. I mean, that that's why we do this. But it's also it's a fight that, you know, needs to be had. And it's it's one that I think is worth having as well. Yeah, that's interesting, because I, I really have no interest in sport. But every now and again, I remind myself that that's about people coming together, isn't it as well? <laughs> that's about that kind of cooperation and and stuff so that's so yeah it's a really beautiful part of it isn't it when people can come together and and create something or pull in the same direction i mean that's we are all made of stars we are all breathing the same air that's yeah. the whole point we work in communities it's just become harder maybe because of sometimes because of technology and because of i mean i was writing my song uh, there's a song called dispensable body on the new album which has a bit about space in it which is why i'm mentioning it but um, there's a bit about um, being far away from the loneliest generation. And I wrote that before coronavirus happened. I wrote it the previous summer because I've been thinking a lot about the fact that the technology that brings us so close together, you know, ruins our attention. It fragments our ability to do things um, and it actually can take us further apart and make us more lonely. It's a real problem um, and something I've been working on for myself for the last few years. But it is so powerful and so brilliant that if it's you know if we if we we could do so much you know that's that's very frustrating sometimes the fact that we could do be doing so much but we're just all scrolling on our phones you know <laughs> a lot of the time and i'm i'm not exempt from this it's just something that's happened to all of us mm. um but there there is still the opportunity to do massive great things like you know pull together and and send things into space which is just i mean yeah. gee whiz i think i think <laughs> gee whiz, so. yeah indeed well you know i mean and again it's you know it's not to say um, that there is uh, any good aspect to what has happened with this pandemic, but if we were to exit it, you know, and, you know, fingers crossed there, of course, um, were we to exit without any lessons learned, you know, at least one of them 
should be our common humanity, right? You know, because this mm -hmm. is the one thing is doesn't matter, you know, um, you know, who you are or, or where you're from, whatever else is the thing that's affected everyone. You know, and, and this is something that we've talked to, you know, other musicians about as well. How has your creative process, um, you know, developed and evolved, you know, under this circumstance of lockdown? I mean, presumably um, you've been, you know, home um, like many of us, you know, um, going on creating and so on. I mean, how have you maintained that process? How has it evolved and how has it, how has it changed or reflected in this time? Is that a question for me? Yes. Okay, so I'm sitting here in the launch pad, which is my home studio. It's It's been called that for a while. Um, I started recording my new album here in February 2019. I decided to do it all on my own, engineer the whole thing, record it all in this room. Um, whereas previously I had taken demos to studios and replayed stuff and, and worked with other people. I didn't want to do that anymore. So I set myself up to record here way before I had to, basically. Um, it was just, it was a creative decision. And then when the lockdown started to happen, first lockdown happened, I mean, I've been through a lot of, you know, emotional turmoil and journey with it. It's not like it hasn't been easy, but because I had all of my stuff set up to record my album and I was halfway through, that part was relatively straightforward. Technically, it's just emotionally was hard to keep going. But what really got me through was being able to be connected. So this is the dichotomy of it. Like I got through as well as I could through the pandemic so far by being connected to people who like music and are connected to me on the internet. You know, genuinely we helped each other. I hope we helped each other through. They definitely helped me through. Um, and I was able to keep making music here and I started releasing singles really as a reaction to what was going on because I wanted to give something. So in the last few years, it's really occurred to me and, and it's been a massive uh, mental shift for me that creating music and sharing it is not about saying, please listen to me, please give me something, money or attention or, or whatever. That's not what it's, it's not what it's about at all for me. It's about me giving something. So yes, of course, there is an exchange of value if people choose to buy things, but they don't have to choose to buy things anymore. So it's much more about a gift. And so my first reaction when, when it started to happen was what can I give people to help them? And all I can give people to help them really is music. And that's what I do. So that's what helped me get through as well was knowing that I, I do have a purpose. And um, I launched my podcast as well because I'm a glutton for punishment. I just love sitting at my computer all the time, <laughs> I guess, working really hard on things that no one asked me to do. Um, that also helped because I got to have conversations with creative people um, on a weekly basis, which was great. Um, so my creative process hasn't changed other than before I chose not to go out and see anyone and do anything. And now I can't. So there is a very big difference because <laughs> when you know you can't, it that can really get to you, as I'm sure obviously everyone has been um, aware of the last 14 months or so. Yeah, so for me, it hasn't changed much, but um, yeah, I kind of wish that it hadn't been forced upon me, that it had to be this way, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so look, Jay, for you, of course, in a band, uh, things are probably different or uh, there are elements to it at least which may be different. I think when you run the band like a mostly benevolent dictator and it's probably actually reasonably similar <laughs> yeah uh there's so much of what laura said there is, you know there's no point just repeating it but but um the the dichotomy i suppose of of this relationship that you have if if you're if you're a creatively minded person you don't have to be a professional anyway but if you do something creatively that helps keep you sane which for me is what music is um but if you need a kind of emotional energy to put into it to kind of get that feedback loop going, it was really hard to do that in the early days of the pandemic because, you know, so much anxiety swirling along, so much uncertainty. Um, you know, it, it was a really scary time, I think, for for most people who who were paying attention. Um, so it was it was really hard. But every time I did make myself do something musically, um, and, and that was difficult as well because we were supposed to be recording the next public service broadcasting record and had to put it on hold because we physically couldn't do it. We couldn't travel to the country where all the equipment was. Um, so I had to try and you know do something else entirely. But every time I did force myself to do something entirely, not even knowing if it was ever going to see the light of day, just knowing it was for me and to keep my kind of head whirring, um, the whole world changed. You know, the, My whole perception of the world changed and, and everything in it was just much more kind of closer to normal. And, and it just felt like kind of a way of getting outside of your head and engaging with the world but but that again talks to what Laura was saying about art in general and the, and the role of art and when she was talking a quote from Alan Bennett just came in my head you know that, that quote from the history boys about art is like 
um, you know, somebody holding their hand out to you and saying, you know, this is an experience I've had too, or, or take my hand, you know, that, that I'm kind of paraphrasing the, the quote from that play. But when that, when I watched that play and heard that line, I was, that's exactly what I, you know, those moments that resonate with you in art, in life are kind of moments when somebody is kind of in effect holding their, their hand out to you. And I think, um, you know, ironically, in the period when nobody could hold out their hands physically <laughs> to each other, I think we've all kind of relied on that in a, in a much more virtual sense. But certainly for me, um, music has helped me get through this period. And, and mm. I, I would be incredibly humbled if, if it were the case that our music had helped anybody else in any, any small measure get through it as well. Um, but I would be doing it regardless of whether it was a, a yeah. career or anything, because um, I think I would probably go mad and not talking flippantly, probably go mad if I didn't. So... <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Same here. It's the only way I can make sense of anything that's going on is is by writing about it. So yeah, I totally agree yeah, with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you, I'll say. I mean, I've done lots of creative things this last year, which I probably never had time for before. Uh, and you know, they, they they may be just for me, but it's exactly that same thing. I mean, just even wandering around the garden now and getting familiar with how many different bees there are out there oh, right? yeah. I mean, and, and taking pictures of them and just and then having to look them up because I'm a geek and wanting to know the name of them and wanting to know their spread and you know are they endangered and everything else so I think you know it, it meant but that's a very inward looking thing it's 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 about me it's not about anything else it's it's about that's finding so, a zen thing yeah. in the day that's so it's important you, you yeah. engaging with the environment as well though it's not just an insular thing is it it's true, but I mean, you know, I've lived here, lived in the same house now for twelve years, and it's probably been the same every su every summer. And we have the weekends off. It's not like I work seven days a week. So why didn't I do it in the past, even though the opportunity was there? It's it's become a kind of a a, a need to go and seek something away from this thing, the screen, and uh, uh, yeah, it is that sort of Zen thing. But let let me flip back because it, unfortunately, Jay, you've completely undermined the question I was going to ask by by saying that PSB is a is a benign dictatorship. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to fold back slightly to the, the point, there's, again, the slightly dark side, well, not the dark side, the, the, the flip side of talking about cooperation and how it is to work together. I think one of the lessons for me about that is not only that you can achieve more um, by working together, but also that you see the flaws and you see the compromises you have to make. You see that everything cannot be perfect the way you want it to be. When you work with other people to achieve a greater goal, you have to find accommodation you have to find you know ways of working with people and and for me that's an equally important lesson about cooperation is you can't have it all your own way you've got to find a way of working together i mean and without you know making the obvious point about brexit and everything else right um going your own way and saying it's all going to be wonderful now it, it's not the lesson I take away from working in an agency with 22 countries. Um, so I just wondered, if, apart from the fact you just tell everybody else what to do in the band, we've, we've established that's, that. I mean, I'm, I'm being, I'm being um, flippant again. <laughs> no. that's, that's not the case, yeah. I mean, I, I do most of the writing. So, you know, the, the kind of the, to be pretentious about the creative vision, you know, starts up here and it's my job to use the, use the you know, involve the whole band in, in translating that to, to hopefully an audience. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would, I, I started off on my own and it was way, way worse than it is now. And uh, I think way less engaging. So it's, it's very much reliant on, you know, these, these moving parts and these kind of, you know, these, these kind of odd intricacies that you get of working with people on a daily basis and, and trying to get the best out of somebody in a recording take, you know, trying to, trying to coax somebody through it. It's, it's such a psychological aspect to it. It's, you know, you do need that, that kind of, um, ability to work with people rather than just barking orders at them and saying do it again that was rubbish or you know going all full spectrum waving a gun around or something it's, it's, <laughs> you, know, you do need that kind of um those kind of skills the, um to 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 really sort of translate your ideas and and the band are obviously an immense part of that for us because um musically they're far more skilled than i am and, and they can take some of the ideas I, that i have and kind of flesh them out and make them into something far bigger and better than than would be possible if it were just me on my own and i know that because i used to do it on my own and it was way worse so yeah <laughs> well, um if, if i could flip things um you know um just to uh, another area because obviously conscious of time and i just kind of feel like um well we, we're only scratching the surface of so many important things um i mean jay uh one of the interesting things that of course you know the race for space was able to do which i thought was so interesting beyond the music itself was of course to change the actual historical narrative that people were actually aware of, because for so many people, um, you know, the space race um, was about the side that they're most familiar with, which is for many people, you know, the American one, you know, um, and so much of the 
the race for space, I mean, by acknowledging, you know, just like the Soviet side, um, I had a very, very great privilege living in London to go to the Cosmonauts exhibit, which was at the Science Museum, which is a great example of, you know, the importance of storytelling. Um, and, you know, I guess just, you know, telling, you know, both sides of stories and so on. Where did that specific impetus come from with you? Uh, because uh, it is such an interesting angle to have taken. I mean, obviously, partially inspired by Mark's background as well, because it is a very different story from from the American one. I think I think it came wanting to to use the the American footage and and some Soviet footage if I could get hold of it. You know, that was a very big question mark when I sort of started thinking about this record. It, it came, I suppose, from a from a narrative point of view. You know, if you're setting two things off against each other, if you have those kind of you know they do this thing, they do that thing, they do that thing, it's a lot more interesting and a lot more dynamic as a kind of as a flow to a record than just and then the Americans did this and then the Americans did this and you know, I think. Um, I think what it what it does show you is is the wisdom in retrospect and also at the time of, of NASA's approach and the Americans' approach of being as open as they were with everything that they did, um, because they have been able to control the narrative in doing that. Whereas the Soviets were in such a much more closed society and so less willing, you know, even to share the name of the person who was designing all their rockets for so long. Um, and, you know, everything was kind of retold or recast or reframed through this very kind of blunt method of propaganda of, um, you know, this this shows the glorious benefits of socialist communist workings. You know, this is the march to the future of the great proletariat. You know, it, it was it had to be kind of it had to fit in this box. And I think in restricting their own narrative in that way and making it so much more closed off to the world, um, they forfeited some of the the kind of um, the right to write history, I suppose. And, and the Americans, in a kind of soft power way which is to be applauded, um, you know, in, in that openness of, of their data sharing and, and to this day, NASA's data sharing, um, you know, they kind of stole a march on them. And they obviously very cannily reframed the whole thing in, in terms of like, the only thing we can realistically beat them to is the moon. So let's make the whole thing about the moon. And everybody just went along with that. So um, yeah, they all, we all know they obviously <laughs> lost pretty much every other major milestone along the way. But um, yeah, they got to kind of write the ending and uh, humans have a great affinity for endings, I suppose. So. I, I wonder in that regard is also the issue of, you know, being in parallel to other, the entertainment industry in the United States, the music industry to some extent, the this idea of selling a vision. I mean, I'm not saying that there wasn't dark music in the United States, but the Beach Boys and that kind of uh, upbeat um, uh, angle of the 60s. Uh, and then the fact that Walt Disney was involved uh, in the early telling of parts of the space race. I mean, prior to it then becoming a real thing, but in the 1950s, you know, building a vision. And I wonder, you know, the, the, we don't think of, from our perspective in the West, about Russia having a great film industry that we have gone back to watch, although they did make some fantastic films like the original Solaris. And then many of the communist countries made very different takes on uh, children's films and children's entertainment, which were not the Disney style uh, of moralizing, much more ambiguous. So I wonder whether that's also partly because we live in a particular milieu culturally and haven't been able to appreciate. I agree about the closed nature and, and the secrecy, but it did fit within a broader cultural aspect, the way America was telling this sort of mythologized story. And maybe the Soviets just didn't have that basis because their Hollywood industry, so to speak, didn't exist, at least for us in the West. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um, yeah. I don't know if I've got much more to add to that. I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's interesting though how we also began this conversation talking about science fiction, right? You know, which is obviously, you know, I mean, it's not constrained by you know technical limits or or anything else like that, and so on. And, and, and in a way, um, you know, I at times wonder if there's a tank of regret in this. Uh, it, you know, happens because we're so accustomed to kind of witnessing space travel. Um, you know, actually, one of the first episodes of Space Rocks um, included um, uh, uh, an, an emergency medic, uh, uh, emergency medical doctor, um, Beth Healy. Um, she may forgive me for probably completely conjuring the wrong job title. Um, <laughs> extreme environments, extreme, extreme, extreme environments, extreme environments medic. medic. Um, but yeah, she spent a, a year on um, Concordia Station in Antarctica. And the reason why we actually invited her, um, you know, uh, among various other reasons, was that unique experience because, you know, that's referred to as the White Mars. And of course, we're at the start of this pandemic as well. And so we were literally just asking her, you know, just what her um, 
what her tips are, you know, if you're experiencing isolation. Because, of course, you know, her experience is so reflective of the experience of so many, you know, astronauts, people in human spaceflight. Um, you know, uh, you know, probably the best comment I ever read about the full audio transcripts of, you know, the Apollo missions is they're a lot like a long car trip, really. <laughs> You know, because I mean, when you condense down what actually happened, of course, it's huge drama. But for a lot of that time, it is just waiting there, checklists, long silences, the same joke, you know, just like literally just like being on tour then. Well, I guess it all <laughs> <laughs> Well, you Very tell much. me. Well, that's no, um, well, that's, that's really interesting. And so um, I, I guess you're probably perfectly then um, situated to answer one of our first questions from the audience, um, which is from Ian Faulkner, um, who asks, um, would each of you, would you actually want to go there? Would you want to go into space? Not really. <laughs> I like the idea of I like the idea of having been to space. <laughs> it's how I feel about quite a lot of gigs I've done as well. It's like I like the idea of having done that, but the long, very long journey, sitting still for a very long time, and you know, bad coffee at Reading Services was probably not the experience <laughs> I was hoping for. Fair I'm enough. happy for others to go and for me to learn from them, and then you know, pull the poetry out of it and serve it back to them. That's my role, I think. Yeah, I'm the fair mirror, enough. you know. Fair, fair I answer. think there's there's a reason I sit in a garage in South East London and write songs about this and, <laughs> instead of uh, <laughs> applying to the ESA astronaut scheme. It's, uh, yeah, it's a total lack of any suitable characteristics for that role. So, um, yeah, it's, it wouldn't be for me. I've, I've only recently, well, it might have lapsed now, but I've only recently become more comfortable with flying to the point where I don't need to take heavy tranquilizers before i get on board so i think me on a on a space voyage would be a bad idea for everybody <laughs> i've sat in enough transit vans going to gigs to last me a lifetime to be honest so i feel it would be similar experience but, but that's interesting in the sense that i mean and it's not not to diminish it but you're talking about the journey aspect i mean if you were able to be transported there with zero cost and i and i mean this as a metaphor because i actually have this feeling that you know many people would who do say oh, I'd love to go to Mars it's like well you're not really thinking about what it means at all are you you just you would like to be there for the experience and as you like as you said Laura the kind of the after party hey I went to Mars that was cool <laughs> yeah. um but but my my slightly cynical perspective on that is that that will become possible in the not too distant future through VR I mean people will mm. be able to go to Mars just sitting on their couch and I rather suspect many people will and they'll just end up staying there um, it's sort of the Ready Player One approach to, you know, simulating a life which is more glamorous than the one that you have, uh, as long as there's none of the bad stuff associated with it, like sitting in a tin can for nine months. People will, I suspect, do it, but um, but then you leave the real world behind. And, and at some, to some extent, you know, that's what space is. It is a fantasy for many people mm -hmm. about leaving this world behind without quite realizing, you know, if you think this one's bad, wait till you go to that one, because it's a lot worse. Uh, you think Mars is a fun place? It really isn't. But uh... I find it concerning the idea that people would want to, I mean, VR sounds you know, amazing, of course, like to go and experience those things, but then to want to use that as a way to not engage with your actual life, I think is, is really a dark place to be in. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's a lot of distractions in this world that we can use to do that. There's a lot of, you know, different drugs and, and drinking and, and social media and all these different well, things it, that we can you, just You mentioned one of these, right? So well, that, yeah, that, you're you know. there already in some way. You're going to hold up a whiskey or something now. <laughs> no, <laughs> unfortunately, no. You mentioned drink? Yes, right. We have the bar right here. Yeah. So my honestly, shirt? like the, the, the quest for me at the moment is to be more, more, more and more present. You know, and that is something that is, there's a lot of things trying to get in the way of me doing that. There's a lot of companies who would prefer me not to be present in my life and for me to use their services all day long. And a lot of the time I do, you know, because they're addictive. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope that people won't want to escape their lives so much because there's so much we can do to improve our lives, you know, to, to want to be present. I think that's, yeah, that's my current mission. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose this is an interesting thing, of course, because, you know, this past year has seen, you know, the advent of, you know, so much live streaming, all of these sorts of things. And what's really apparent to me is this is a very sci-fi, you know, kind of view of things is that it's not about and it never is about the availability of technology, is it? It's about the cultural shift or the reasons why people <clears throat> might need to, you know, or whatever else. And 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 yet I yeah, I do just wonder, um, you know, and it, it, I don't know if it makes me a Luddite. 
um, whether there's there are just some things that simply can't be reproduced and they just have to be in a room, you know, just like with a with a stack of amps, um, you know, probably listening to music that might be a little too loud. Um, and uh, that's that's just the way to experience things because it, it is about being together. Something you said, Laura, about social media is that the irony of it being called social media. You didn't exactly say that, right? But it, it actually fragments our attention, but also fragments our connections with people as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Because um, because you're led to believe that you are connected with everyone all the time, but but you're not really, you know, it's not it's not being in the room. Yeah, it's not, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, it's not that I think these experiences aren't real because this is a real experience that we're all having. It's just that when you think about <clears throat> live gigs, when you're in a room watching a band or an artist or what have you, the reasons that I would be on the stage playing might actually be able to be replicated by me doing it at home. So I, I'm perfectly happy playing online. I've been doing it since 2013. It was great when everyone realized they could have been doing it for so long and jumped on last year. <laughs> like, well done. The internet's been there for a long time. But I am pleased that people have, have come to it. I don't see those as not being real gigs. But when you think about it from the perspective of the audience member, um, some audience members do only want to just hear the song in per you know perfectly recorded, nice. They don't they don't want anyone around them. They don't need a drink, whatever. But a lot of people go to to gigs for different things. It very much depends. Are you going to see your friends and have some drinks and and have a release and an escape? Is it an after work thing? Is it a ritual of some kind? So we have to think in other people's you know from other people's perspectives to go what what is it that they are wanting to get. Because like I say, I, I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly happy. I would be perfectly happy, to be quite honest, to only play gigs from this room forever because <laughs> I get to just play my songs and I get to talk to people and it's a manageable thing. I don't have to go anywhere. It's not costing me loads of money what, and all the, all the things are fine for me. But I know that that's not what everybody is going to a gig for, mm -hmm. you know, to have that opposite experience. So. I, would, I would chip in over here. Is I, I would, you know, in a friendly manner, obviously, but I would disagree strongly. Like, it's also not what everyone is is playing a gig for. I don't think. Like, one of the reasons oh, we no, haven't. Oh no, no, sorry. I just mean that's what. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... You know, obviously, it's personal to you, but I mean, but um, you know, one of the reasons we haven't done any streaming stuff, quite apart from the fact that I ripped our live set to pieces to do other stuff with it and haven't put it back together again, um, so it's a physical impossibility, is because f for me, the gig is is not a kind of, you know, the the audience is here and the performers there. It's it's the two coming together and. Mm -hmm. You know, when when you play, I mean, God knows how many nights in a row we've done in the past. When you do like 14 shows in a row or something, you swiftly realize that you are not the most important aspect of the show. You know, the people in the room are the most important aspect of the show. And um, they kind of bring the atmosphere and they bring the energy and you kind of feed off that. And then they feed off that. And then you feed off that. And it's it, you do get this kind of it's another kind of feedback loop. You know, it's a virtuous circle. Um, and I just can't see how that happens online i mean i haven't done it so i'm speaking from a position as of most of my life of profound ignorance <laughs> but um yeah it's it's it's, <clears throat> it's nothing to do for me with that feeling of of the connection of people in a room and the kind of the mutual feedback that you get because crowds are so weird crowds are so weird two nights in the same venue could be totally different yeah. And you could play exactly the same notes you know you could turn up and just press space bar or something which we don't but you could um and one night you'd just be like, what is wrong with people? What's going on? And the next night, within 10 seconds, you would know, whoa, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be one of the best gigs we've ever done if, if we don't muck it up. But this, the situation is, you know, you can feel the scenario, the atmosphere is right. You know that you have what they want and, you know, vice versa. It, yeah, it's that kind of chemistry. And I, I, I struggle to see how you could recreate that in a, in a virtual way. But again, I don't think you can. It's just that what I'm saying is that they're not, I mean, they're not virtual because they're real no. they're really happening yeah, that's that's true yeah. not to be a pedant to you but it's just I, i've seen some bands go, kind of go can't wait for real gigs and i think that's just a real does a real disservice to all the people who have shown up to watch online gigs over the last year who have got a lot from it yes they probably would have preferred to go down and see you in in real life you know whatever um but but this is just something that has provided something for people who really need that that escape of music so they can close their eyes and listen to the music and still have a version of an escape that they need and the thing is i mean i, I don't i'm not backpedaling on what i said about like i'd be perfectly happy to never go out again because of course i want to go out again and i do want to play gigs again but um yeah i i feel much more than for myself i feel for the people who go out to gigs three four five nights a week even you know and and it's such a big part of their lives and all of that social life and all of that escape and and that 
connection to music and and hearing songs that that that's you know sum up the things that they're thinking and feeling in a way that they they feel they can't which gives them such um such a boost you know that was ripped away from people of course because of everyone having to be super safe and so i just feel more for for the audience than i do for myself i suppose mm. is my point and i just don't like people saying that they're you know the real gigs are the ones where we're all in a room because these are just, you know this is still really happening right now so yeah. well um, unless i'm yeah. imagining it but yeah, i don't think uh, I yeah, no, but it's, it's such an important and interesting conversation and what a sci-fi future we're all in right now that we're actually having it you know yeah. when you think about 2001 you know just uh, again all of these technologies little ipads and whatever else and you know um to bring it back into music um very funnily um gene simmons you know uh basis of kiss if people aren't familiar he was once asked if his hair was real and um well he turned to the interviewer and said uh, well define real and of course this is the, the the rabbit hole that we find ourselves in you know um yeah. are we all going to live in you know proverbial happy boxes you know um you know, just are we in a simulation right now these are all things that are fundamental to uh you know philosophy um not just science fiction you know and they're questions that we're going to have to be asking ourselves time and time again and i wish that we had time to explore all of them on tonight's show um but uh but yeah we're uh, we're we're winding down just a, a little bit and um so i'm going to be forced to ask uh you know another question so iPods have never been invented. Um, you know, kids watching, look them up. Because, <laughs> of course, they haven't been a thing for a while. You can, you have no storage devices at all. What record are you taking on a space journey with yourselves? Oh, wow. It's as if this is a standard question we've ever asked before. Where did that come from? All of a <laughs> so what format are we allowed to take if we don't uh, have an iPod? Well, I, I suppose, um, I don't know if space, uh, vinyl, um, has, has vinyl ever been played in space, Mark? I mean, no, there's a slight yeah. problem with the gravity, I suspect. Yeah, okay, so fine, I, suppose, but, uh... so I believe cassette tapes work, so you can, you can bring a cassette. <laughs> I love cassettes. I've got so many cassettes <laughs> under this table I could show you, but I won't because we don't have time. Um, I would probably take one of the first albums that blew my mind as a little kid, which is Out of the Blue by ELO oh, with Mr. Go. Blue Sky at the end. That, is a, that is a big weird brilliant song i mean oh, it just goes somewhere <laughs> that you don't expect it to it's just yeah something else cool nice i think i would go for the pretentious side of it and say you know i my favorite records i feel like i kind of know them note for note you know when one song ends the next one starts in my head regardless of what follows it so i think i'd try and take something um I'd go the Desert Island Discs approach. You know, you're allowed the complete works of Shakespeare and the Bible, aren't you? So would you be allowed all of Beethoven's symphonies? Would you be allowed <laughs> that on one long cassette? Like a 240-minute cassette on long speed or something? Yeah, is it? Because um, like, yeah, yeah. I feel like I, I could listen to that for the rest of my life and still not understand it um, mm. fully. Um, and, and not to say that I understand my favourite records fully, but um, I feel it would challenge me and continue to be fresh for for longer, possibly. Mm. Um yeah, that's that's what I would, and the depth of that kind of music I think is probably better suited to infinite uh, emptiness. <laughs> and and it would sound brilliant on a cassette player as well, undoubtedly, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, maybe. Well, well, keep, uh, yeah. Keeping in mind, I mean, there's this. You you could take a CD. CDs work, and you have to remember that the length of the CD was set, I think, according to the length of one of Beethoven's symphonies. There was yeah, a discussion right. with. With it, was it with von Karajan, I think, and then Phillips or whoever yeah. it, said it must be it must be this length, eighty minutes, because one of the symphonies is that long. Um, That's a great fact. Um, I, I think was it's the, wasn't that. it the fifth? Wasn't it? Was it the fifth on the ninth? It's the fifth on the ninth. I, I, I was going to I was going to say almost exactly the same thing, but I was going to substitute Mahler, but rather than Beethoven. So I don't know how no, long Beethoven. The CD would be about three hours long if it was Mahler. That's yeah, well, sure. if I had all ten <laughs> symphonies of, well, I do have multiple copies of all ten, nine, nine plus the unfinished one, but uh, wow. yeah, that would definitely be my my choice, Mahler. But so that, that, that's, that's that, the one all our all our session, you know, musician players who they're all classically trained. They're always banging on about Mahler. I can't. Well, it's a regard, can't quite go into it myself. <laughs> banging on about Mahler. <laughs> oh, stop Let's banging on about Mahler. <laughs> It was a weird thing. I mean, I was, you know, kind of had a, 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 a didn't have a classical upbringing at all, but I listened to classical music. I mean, Holst and, and 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 Beethoven and Bach and so on. But I discovered Mahler at university, and it just just completely blew my mind. I mean, it just changed everything I thought about classical music at the time. So, you know, I'd say it's an odd one because it wasn't really popular for a long time until the sixties, right? I mean, after he finished in mm. nineteen ten, 
it was sort of shelved and uh, but came it's back. So in the expensive 60s. to do, wasn't it? Because there was just yeah, so yeah. massive. But... Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Now we've definitely left the uh, the world of space. I don't know. No, I'm just, all, all I'm saying is I'm just 100 percent um, holding on to that bit of trivia it will forever be entered into like my <laughs> oh, i would check it i would definitely <laughs> yeah, well exactly it could it, it, <laughs> just Snopes, no, no, Snopes, way of a good com, exactly it may just be a complete <laughs> urban legend but indeed well what a fantastic chat i've got to say lauren what an absolute pleasure it was to share these ideas with you and thank you so thank much you. for sharing your time with us of course thank you. Likewise. And, and likewise. And of course, as, as without saying when we do things for real again, because we're doing it now, but <laughs> but when we can engage with an audience, uh -oh. um, what we would love to do, of course, you know, we, we have done um, live events where we bring bands in, we bring in scientists, we bring in astronauts. And the main thing in Space Rocks is not to sort of compartmentalize them at all, but to somehow mingle it during the day. And I know that Jay, you've certainly done events. You've done. Did you do Blue Dot at some point? Was that right? Uh, Blue we, Dot we've done it twice here. We've been lucky yeah, enough yeah. to do it twice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's a great exemplar of the sort of thing which Space Rocks uh, would aim to be. Although we're mobile, we're not kind of you know there under the big dish at uh, Jodrell mm. Bank. Um, so we would love to engage both of you at some point uh, when we can uh, get out there and, and and do some of that stuff. And, and Laura, you've done the Cosmic Shambles stuff, of course, which is similar in its yeah, own way as well. Indeed. Um, 100 percent echoed um uh now before we go this just in from the chat carl walker um at isa has piped in um you might be in oh, number one yes um that um mr blue sky was actually played on the space station last week by astronaut thomas pesquet <laughs> awesome pretty cool so Very good place cool. there and um i don't know if this actually lives up to that first bit but you know um the proclaimer song i'm gonna be um or 500 miles has the same running time as it takes a space station to fly a thousand miles. The last line of the song. So that's brilliant. Space facts, fantastic. Okay, so wow. you know, yeah. just let, let float. If, on ever, if, if ever you think you're geeky, then Carl <laughs> is even geekier than the rest of the <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Yeah. Very good. Indeed. Well, before you guys go, we have we have traditions. Yes, we do. I know. You know, we, what is this now? What are we on? Episode forty-six or something? Uh, Forty-seven. Yeah. I mean, you you mentioned Jay that you 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 made a decision at some point earlier in your career, and and sometimes you regret it. Well, um, <laughs> in email, not this evening. Oh yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and and I'm not sure I regret this one, but but occasionally it's embarrassing to ask our guests to do it. So we we, we sign off um, by it's always a test. Who can do the Vulcan uh, salute? Uh, as in that? space, that space, live long and prosper. Yep. And and then rocks for and then, space and, and rocks. We we kind of do a different one of that until we try and make the horns as small as possible. So we kind of go like that. And, and what, what's the <laughs> rationale for the smallest horns possible? The, just, the, the least rocky rock band? The most self-deprecating rock band. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's just funny. If you just look over at your guitar tech in the middle of a song and he just looks back at you and he just does that. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us laugh. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. Well, look, Good thank luck. you very much both for coming on this evening. Thanks. And again, as Alex says, we could go on for hours, but you've got things to do. I, we, we've all got things to do, but it's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Okay. Bye-bye now. Well then. Well, Mark, um, well, that was a fun conversation and it went to places, um, well, like all episodes of Uplink, um, that uh, you, you can never really predict, which is just fantastic. What, what a great pair of musicians and minds as well. And uh, and I have to say, you know, um, well, I mean, just like uh, real or virtual, um, you know, just like when we get back to putting on gigs, I mean, I know whose doors we're going to be knocking on, certainly. And uh, if there's no. not a, if there's not a match made in heaven for you know a, a, a gig with PSB and with Laura and and her space inspired music, you know, what are we doing? What are we doing if that's not uh, if that's not first on the on the list? Indeed, indeed, yeah, an, an exciting chat and uh, just fantastic to uh, to bring them both into the fold. Mark, as ever, um, a pleasure to chat with you. And uh, well, we have some pretty exciting news for Uplink coming up, but um, to learn all about it. Go to spacerocksofficial.com, sign up to our newsletter, follow us on our social media, and, um, well, we'll be seeing you very soon indeed. Yeah, indeed. And uh, as you say, some great exciting stuff coming up in the near future, which uh, we'll share with you when the moment is right. But until then, good night, everybody. Good night from me, and it's good night from him. <laughs> we'll see you soon.